Okay. Um, we want to sort of go through the words in the vocabulary on page 31 of Hansen and Quinn, the, the first vocabulary list um, and that you're going to learn uh, in, in Greek. Um, um, we want to make some comments about the particular words, but learning learning vocabulary words is obviously an important part of Greek, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, of learning any language. So um, we are, we're going to correct some things. We're going to emphasize some things. We're going to make some comments. Um, but the thing that you need to do is to start thinking about how you want to learn these words. Staring at them uh, isn't enough. <laughs> um, you need to make an effort. And... and uh, um, writing them down on a piece of paper and saying them out loud or reading them into a some kind of a recording device and listening to them uh, learning you know one one of the things that I did what, what, I don't know what kinds of things that you use there are these online things we keep saying we're going to do that we, we should get you to make a list of there are these sites that will make make um, online uh, um, uh, little cards for you. Oh, flashcards. Uh, flash cards, yeah, yes. Like Quizlet. Yes, Quizlet, things. yes. Um, they, they, you can do that. Um, but you need to do something to teach yourself. And uh, one thing that I recommend is that if you're going to do things like flashcards, instead of going from the Greek word to the English word, you do it the other way around. Mm -hmm. That is, you try to you look at the English word and try and think of the Greek one. That is, So you, it's kind of being on the inside of Greek instead of on the outside of it. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, let's look at these words. So the, the first thing to notice is that there's a convention that, the, that is not just the books about how you list uh, nouns. That is, for example, the first one is agora, and that's the nominative singular. That's the base form of any Greek noun, the nominative singular. And then the second form is its genitive, agoras. Okay, agora is a noun of the chora type. That is, it's a techne type where the original long alpha has not changed into an eta, okay? So, um, and it shows see, the rule yes. that we talked about. When it's accented on the final syllable, it changes yeah. to a circumflex. So, excellent, a right. So we see that. And um, and we we also see that the third thing after it is he, mm -hmm. okay? That is the feminine nominative singular of the definite article. That's the way in which you... You express what gender a Greek noun is by putting the appropriate gender of the nominative of the article. So if you go down to the next one, adelphos, it gives you adelphos, adelfu, the genitive, and then ha. And then it tells you in parentheses that it has this weird vocative accent, adelpha. That's why it's giving it that form. So, so nominative, genitive, and gender um, are enough to identify that, that the reason we have these three things is that. With them, you can identify the class, that is the declensional class, is what we call them, to which any noun belongs. Once you see those three forms, and you, you've learned nouns in the way that we're doing them here, you can tell which, which class it belongs to, okay? Nominative, genitive, and gender. So a dictionary, all the dictionaries give you those that information first. Okay. It's all messed up, but you know what it says. Yes. <laughs> all right. Um, so the book doesn't tell you this, but it, it, it's it's important to understand. Um, then it defines, let's look at these words, there's agora, um, which it defines as marketplace, okay? Um, it, it's, it's, um, it, it comes from, this is a, a noun from a verb that means gather, okay? So it's a place, gathering place, okay? Um, and in Greek city-states, there are various words in different different Greek dialects, but in Greek city-states there's a theory anyway, a central space, which is held in common, like the Boston Common, okay, where where people congregate in a climate like that of Greece, people can congregate in all the kinds of weather. Um, and if you go to Athens, there's a, you can go visit the Agora, the Americans excavated it. It's a big area, okay, where lots of public business was held where there were uh, uh, buildings having to do with the government of the, of the city-state. There was a prison. Um, there were places in which famous people were immortalized and all kinds of stuff like that. So it's a place where, where people would, would go and hang out, okay? Um, and, and so it's an important thing. In a more, it's not just about buying and selling stuff, although that went on as well. There are places, for example, we know there was a place where there were banks, 
book day because ancient Greeks had banks. We know there was a place where people sold books in the latter part of the 5th century when mm. people started writing books, each one by hand, okay, because there was no printing press, things like that. So so it's a kind of lively area. It's not far from the cemetery, and it, it's it's just at the foot of the Acropolis. You look up and you see the Parthenon from the other on Africa. It's a great place to go. All right. Um, so we want to expand a little bit more on the cultural value of this word, okay, um, in, in some Greek city-states. Other Greek city-states have other names for this central space, and, um, and we can talk about that when we get to them. So there's adrophos, the word for brother. We talked about that earlier. There's anthropos, which it translates in, a, in an old-fashioned way as man. It only means man in the sense of human being, okay? It means, yeah, it means human being as opposed to animals. Okay? Um, it's not a gender specific, even though it's a masculine noun, it's not a gender specific term. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it's not like man in, in, in English. Okay? It, it means human being of, any, of either gender as opposed to lion or dog or animal okay? as a class. Um, then the next word is biblion, bibliu. Okay? So there you see a nominative that ends in nu. Okay? Um, that's that's it tells you that it's the second declension neuter noun like dolron. Okay, the genitive is u, and there it tells you ta. The genitive is that the gender is neuter, and it says that means book. Okay, that's an anachronism. Okay, there were no books in ancient Greece. Okay, what people wrote on papyrus, that's what the biblos part of it comes from, and what biblion means is a, a little thing made out of papyrus. Okay, and what it refers to is not book but scroll. Okay, the Greeks made big scrolls of papyrus on a on a wooden thing that you could unroll and uh, and read that way when they had books okay which they didn't have for a long time and writing was not a was not a feature of Greek city states until that people accepted until the latter half of the fifth century BCE this is uh, um, several years after the I mean several hundred years after the historical period and after they actually had a writing system mm -hmm. okay so so you have a writing system already attested in the 8th century BCE, but the people mm -hmm. didn't use it. Okay, they hated it, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyhow, um, there's doron, the word for gift, okay? Um, in this society, gifts are a big deal. Um, um, we can talk more about that some other time. Um, it says, that also, the dictionary, this, the vocabulary list says that it means a bribe, okay? And that's just a, a gift in a political context, okay? Um, the, 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 to us, that sounds very bad, and we wouldn't want to have the same word be something nice like a gift and bribe, and also something bad like a bribe, okay? But um, it means it means stuff that, uh, that you give to people in order to get something back in return, okay? The notion of, of reciprocity is an, um, not just an implicit, but even an explicit thing in this word. If I give you a gift, you owe me one in return, okay? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of language like that in ancient Greek about giving gifts. All right, then we get in a row three prepositions: ace, which means into or in, or in, with a with a, In other cases, it means for the purpose of. Okay, so if you have, for example, the word for battle after ace, ace machen is the word. Um, we've got it a little bit farther down, mache maches he, which is a noun like techne. If you say ace mache, it, it can mean into battle or for the purpose of battle, for fighting, okay, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have this association in English between into or in and for, but it means motion into a place, okay. And, the, and then the next one is ek or x, okay. The reason that you have the two forms is that it's ek when the next word begins with a vowel and x when it begins with a consonant, okay. Um, this is important things about how different languages deal with the words that go together and, the, and, and how they, their final syllables or vowels change. But uh, it's not a universal thing in Greek that, are for, uh, that, that you have stuff like this happen, but there are very few words in Greek that end with a K. Lots that end with an S. <laughs> yeah. Okay? Um, the, the, the third of the three, and that means out of or from, okay? Um, and then finally, there's n, which means in. Okay, so what's the difference between ace and n? Um, ace is going into a place, um, and um, or to a place, and n is sitting in a place. Okay, 
Um, notice all three of these have no accents, so they're like ha and he, the definite article and the nominative singular masculine feminine, and hoi and hi. Um, that is, they become a syllable of the word that follows them. These are prepositions, prepositions in English, which means that the pre part means that they come before a noun that follows them. So into a house, out of a house, in a house. You've got to have a noun after them in English, and you do in Greek. And the little thing after, when it says ace, and then it says prep, that's, that's the abbreviation for preposition, and then it says plus ACC. That means the noun that follows ace has to go in the accusative case. Um, the noun that follows ek or x has to go in the genitive case, and the noun that follows n has to go in the dative case. Now, uh, the, these, these cases are not randomly assigned to these words, and they have to do with general functions of cases, but we can talk about that later on. Uh, all right, the next noun is ergon, ergu, uh, ta, a neuter noun. Uh, originally, that was wergon, with a w, but the w, as we said today in class, disappeared. So it's actually cognate with the word work in English. Okay, um, maybe that's helpful. Now, here we come to theos. We're getting, getting too much time on these things. Theos is a, a noun that means God, okay? It gives you the nominative theos and the genitive theou, and then it says after it, for where you expect the genitive, ha or he, okay? In other words, theos can be masculine or feminine, okay? It's not that the form, the form doesn't change. It still looks like theos, but if it's, you can say he theos. Now, it, that's true in Attic Greek. And even more specifically, if in Athens you say, hey, Theos, who is it, Belisi? Athena. Yeah, she's the goddess. Okay, you don't have to say any more. It's like Our Lady, okay? Um, it's mm -hmm. it's, a, it's just enough of a cue as to who it is on the place and the words. But but it's an example of what we were talking about, and that is that norm nouns that look like they're second declension can be masculine, but some of them, most of them are masculine, but some of them are feminine, and some of them are like the os. That is, they can switch, okay, depending on whether you, what you mean. So here's a case where gender isn't just grammatical because gods have real gender, mm -hmm. and you distinguish between the males and the female ones with the definite article. All right, then there's chi, one of many words in Greek that means and, okay, it's mind-boggling. And seems like a simple enough concept, but in Greek there are all kinds of ways to slice and dice it. So it's the one that basically connects sentences, okay? Um, we, we tend to discourage people from using and, but to use to connect one sentence to another, except with a comma, um, in English anyway, but you can do that a lot with chi. Um, but you can also coordinate sentences, like today it's hot and I feel sweaty, okay? That's, that you can do with chi, okay? Um, when you have two of them together, when you say chi this, chi that, then it means both and, Okay, and usually it's sentences, but it can also be individual words. So chi is the kind of commonest and the most ubiquitous word for and. Okay. Um, there's logos, logu, ha, the word for word, speech, and story. It also means reason, okay? <laughs> so that's pretty complicated. That's a lot of different things for one word that we distinguish. Okay, so here's the, the opposite thing. That Greek has one word where we have many, okay? Doesn't happen that often. Mache, as I said a moment ago, is a word for battle. Mesos. So here's a regular noun of the second declension, mesos, mesu, and it gives us gender as he, okay? As it, that is, it's feminine, okay? A book will try and trip you up with things like mesos, he, and theos, he. Watch out for these things. So it's inflected just like the masculine nouns logos, logos, or logos type, but its gender is feminine, he. Um, and the same is true of the word after the definite article, hados, the word for road. The word nesos we have in things like Peloponnesus. I don't know, that's a Greek place. Um, do we have any other nesis words in English? I can't think of any. Um, but anyhow, there's hados survives in English in the word that you use for the thing in a car that registers the miles you've gone, which is called? Odometer. There you go. <laughs> yep. So it's a word for road, okay? Um, next word is oikia, oikios, which means house or household, okay? It's really a, not, not a, a word for a physical uh, unit so much as a, as, a, um, as a sociological unit. It means the people, the, the physical house and the people in it, and the people can be uh, citizens and slaves, okay? And even include the animals, so mm -hmm. 
So that's that. Then we get Homeros, Homeru, uh, the name of the poet Homer. Okay, we're going to learn lots of things about him that are untrue because we're just making up sentences. He didn't have a brother, believe it or not. You're going to find <laughs> lots of sentences about his brother that we know of anyway, but that's an example of a good Greek name. We get two verbs in the third person singular, more about that, the one that means educates and the one that means sends, paideoe and pempe. More about verbs in the next lesson, so you need them to be able to make some kind of sense. So that's why we're, we're, we're teaching, the, the book divides that in the next lesson. Then there's techne, chora, psuche, okay, the word that means soul. We talked about this when we were starting to read. Psuche, psuche, notice it's got an accent on the last syllable and, and, and it shows the accent in Bula Belisi pointed out where the genitive has a circumflex and the nominative has an acute um, in the first declension noun. And lastly, there's the word o with a circumflex accent and a smooth breathing over it that, that says it's used with evocative. In fact, it identifies vocatives, okay? It distinguishes them from nominatives. So you used o in Greek to say, to make sure that people know that it's not the subject of a sentence. Um, we don't have to translate it in English <laughs> as o, the, the letter o, o, o bill. Nobody says that anymore, <laughs> okay? Um, if you feel, feel, feel like it, you can, but that's, not, that's it. All right. So I've given you some help with the vocabulary. I hope it's interesting. That was a long-winded thing. All right. <laughs>